Call to order the Brentwood Board of Aldermen meeting for October 1st, 2018. If you'd all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, roll call, please. Thank you. Mayor Thornton? Here. Alderman Dimmitt? Here. Alderman Kramer? Present. Alderman Leahy? Here. Alderman Lockmiller? Here. Alderwoman O'Neill? Here. Alderman Plufka? Here. Alderwoman Sims? Here. And Alderman Wagey? Here. All right, I make it a full board. Uh, let's see, item number three on the agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Are there any changes uh, to the agenda? Alderman Leahy? Your Honor, if I may, I'd like to take the consent agenda, item F, which is resolution 1114. This is the proposition D that is on the November ballot. I would like to pull that from the consent agenda and ask that it be placed on hold. I have a question to the Secretary of State about this resolu the taxing and I'd like to have a chance to get an answer back from before we cast a vote on this. So could I put it on hold to maybe as late as the 5th of November, but possibly we could handle it on the 15th of October if I get an answer back from the Secretary of State? All right, I'm gonna take that as motion to postpone item 19F until October the 15th. And then if you're not ready at that point in time, we can postpone it again. If, if I may be given that courtesy. Sure, please. absolutely. Uh, does the motion have a second? It does. So we'll have a, a discussion on the motion to postpone item 9F until the 15th of October. Any discussion at all? Your Honor, may we ask the Alderman what the question, nature of the question was? You sure can. The question that I've asked the sta Secretary of State, in the, 50, the tax that they're looking to interpret, to Im implement, they would be by legislative approval and uh, putting out by the legislator out of the general revenue for what they collect in. But it does not establish what are they going to do with the money that is currently coming out of the general revenue for that, for roads and bridges. Is this tax money going to be an additional or is this going to be like we had with the lottery where they get this tax money and the regular money stays in the general revenue for the legislature to put out at other discretionary needs? And thus I'm trying to figure out if it's a written, written correctly or not. I believe this is why it had so much trouble and didn't get out of committee but came in as an amendment to another bill but I can't find anything to confirm that. So I have asked the Secretary of State to help me answer the question. And so, Your Honor, do we have any emergent need to pass it this evening? Or is, what is the proposed timeline? That you we don't have to pass it at all, as far as I know. Okay, I don't know how it came about, actually. It's just a resolution in support of the tax? It's just a resolution to educate the citizens of Brentwood that the Board of Aldermen supports um, this referendum on the ballot. So, as I understand it, building on what Bola just had to say, in section one and two, we don't take a position in this resolution as to whether we're in favor of it or against it, do we? We don't. So I'm, 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 just, I'm just curious as to why, why the delay. If, if all we're doing is educate. resolving to educate voters, then, then why the delay that you described? Because I'd like to have my facts correct that if we go into this resolution, and if what I believe is true, then I would uh, try to persuade this board that encouraging the citizens to pass this would not be a good thing. We, and if we're doing it just for education, then I think we should give them that education also so okay. that they understand okay. what they're voting for or against. As, as I read the resolution, we don't take a position. Nope. We are, it, it, we, our intent is to inform the citizenry. Right, but what you I just said like a minute inform, ago was, okay. Yes, but I'd like to inform them of the pros and cons so that they make a good decision. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any further discussion on the motion? All right, the motion is to amend tonight's agenda, agenda to place item 9F, uh, to postpone item 9F until the October 15th meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? 
Uh, me. <laughs> I'm going to try this again. We're going to raise our hands. <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand of, of amending the agenda. Two, three, four, five. All opposed to amending the agenda, raise your hand. One, two, three. The uh, in favor uh, um, have it by a vote of five to three, and we will amend tonight's agenda to place item 9F on the October 15th agenda. Thank you, Your Honor. Are there any other changes to this evening's agenda? Seeing none, is there any objection to approval by acclamation? Seeing none, it will be so approved. Uh, item number four on tonight's agenda, announcements, appointments, proclamations, and recognitions. Uh, we have one announcement, and uh, it concerns our Brentwood Days. Uh, Brentwood Days float contest this year uh, was won by uh, the Blues Brothers. Oh, wait, I'm reading that wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I misread. Uh, <laughs> No, the, uh, the, the first place prize was won by the Brentwood Middle School, whose float was the uh, Pac-Man. And we have with us this evening Brianna uh, Draper, who's here to accept the prize. And I understand the prize was given by an anonymous donor. Is that, is that what happened? Oh, by sponsors. All right, so great. All right. Great sponsors. And we have this. Oh, wow. 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 A, pan a pantomime check. <laughs> Get a good one. <laughs> the other one's for the warrant list, so. <laughs> All right, I don't think we have any other announcements. Oh, we do. We have a couple more. Oh, we yeah, have a couple more announcements. Sorry, I didn't realize that we were awarding prizes for second and third. Yes. Wow. We actually have second and third place winners, and they are here tonight to get theirs. We wanted to recognize them. And second place was West Community Union, and we have Lori Hudson here tonight. with um, Crystal Jones over at the high school and she has a program she was looking to get funded. Um, it's office suite, I guess, for the kids that she wanted to purchase. So we are donating the funds back to her and to that program. So this will be the Stanley Cup of parade floats. Just one last quick thing is just to recognize our sponsors. We had Navigate Building Solutions, West Community Union, at Credit Union, and we heard they are donating back to the schools. UMB Bank is a Chiadini architect. Yep. Fast Sign, Kalachi Factory, SM Wilson, Planning Design Studio, Great Southern Bank, 
Cunningham recognition, Geyser Death vending, by statement, by state development, help within family chiropractic, state mechanical, and winning street. Uh -huh. And I think I can say with some confidence that had there been a bragging rights trophy last year, that it also would have gone to Ward 3 for their, uh, their pirate ship. So uh, you know, I, I think the rest of the wards have our work cut out for us when it comes to uh, getting a hold of that bragging rights trophy. Uh, all right. Um, we don't have any public hearings this evening, and uh, that brings us to item number six on the agenda, which is citizens' comments. If any member of the public would like to address the Board of Aldermen on any topic of your choosing, Please come forward, state your name and your address, and you'll be given at least three minutes to talk. Mr. Youngblood. Good evening. Uh, John Youngblood with the Burlington Fire Department, Shop Steward. Um, I wanted to come and talk to you tonight just briefly. Uh, at the last Board of Aldermen meeting, uh, the discussion came up uh, during Hickney's compensation study results of uh, the 95th percentile as opposed to the 75th where we're at right now. Um, you know, for us, we have uh, about a third of our department right now has been with us less than two years. Um, and at the 75th percentile, unfortunately, I, I feel that we're kind of falling behind. We're not as competitive as we really could be. Uh, there's a number of departments hiring right now. Um, Clayton, Melville, Pattonville, Eureka, Metro West, Central County, and Creek Four. Um, and I have to say, I don't know that Brentwood um, is necessarily as competitive uh, in the market uh, at the 75th percentile. So we, we really, uh, our six new guys, you know, we've trained them, they've come in, they've been excellent employees. And, you know, if we're going to stick at the 75th percentile, my fear is, is long term uh, that we're going to start losing these guys and become a training ground uh, for other places in the county. Um, and for us, it's a, it's a safety concern uh, because we like guys that come in that, that we know have our backs that can do the job. Um, so uh, we would just ask that tonight if the board would consider um, adopting the 95th percentile. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to address the Board of Aldermen? Going once, going twice, sold American. Mm -hmm. uh, any mayor or alderman response? Seeing none. Um, under mayor and alderman reports, uh, this evening I have one thing. Uh, I would like to recommend uh, five people for the uh, Brentwood Bound Community Engagement Task Force. Uh, John Nuremberger, Greg Reinders, Paul Turner, Mary White, and Mark Womer. All five of them have expressed interest in joining the effort. Uh, I think they'd be wonderful additions to the group. And uh, I guess uh, I'm looking for the uh, alderman to sort of give a thumbs up or thumbs down on these appointments. Since they're not really standing committees, it's not, I don't think strictly required that you all approve, but I, I guess what I would do is just ask for a straw poll vote. Uh, and if there's any discussion, you could have it now or any comments on any of those folks. Alderman O'Neill. Which wards are these people yeah, from? Yeah, so John Nuremberger is Ward 3, Greg is Ward 3, Greg Reinders, Paul Turner is in Ward 1. Mary White's in Ward 3, and Mark Wolmer is in Ward 1. Um, uh, and I will say, because I know, I know your concern, and, and Alderman Kramer's concern as well, I will say that I have struggled mightily to find uh, volunteers from Ward 4, unfortunately. I Mr. Chairman, been too successful. Mr. Chairman, I think Greg Reinders is in Ward 1. I believe that address is wrong for yeah, Greg it, Reinders. It is. He does not he lives live on, you know, he lives on I thought that, but then, yeah. uh, you know, I've never been over to his house, so. <laughs> So, yeah, okay, so Reinders is also Ward 1. So two from Ward 3, three from Ward 1. Yeah. There has to be some way to reach more Ward for, for people so they know that if they are interested to volunteer. I don't think many of them realize that they can express an interest in volunteer. I'd be more than happy to come to the next Ward 4 meeting and talk a little bit about the project. And I, I, I don't know exactly how to do that, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm very happy to have equal and large numbers from every ward in the city to, to work on this. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd be very happy to, <laughs> to help, but I don't know exactly how to do that either. Your Honor, I did send over a recommendation to yourself and our city administrator, however, this particular topic is not necessarily in the field of interest right. of right. many folks. And so 
I, we, there are some potentials, but this is a special uh, item here. Right. So, but we can add more. <coughs> we, uh, like There's I plenty said, of time. I am very happy to have large numbers from every ward on this, this, this group. There's no limit. Perhaps we'll, we'll do it next door. Probably. There's no set limit. Let's put it that. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. So uh, just a, a simple voice vote will do, I think. If you approve of these uh, additions to the group, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay. Seeing none, we'll add them to the group. Thank you. And, and again, any ward that has residents that would like to participate, any alderman that knows of any resident or would like to recommend any resident to participate, Simply give me the name and we will do the footwork of reaching out to them, contacting them, telling them what it's all about and seeing if they want to play. Your Honor, do you know, do we know what the date is for the next meeting of that January? Group? There, there's a meeting being held right now. Aha. Uh -huh. And the, um, so they're going to set a night, tonight they're going to set the next? The next date. Okay. If you could just. I believe it's, I believe it's more or less a monthly kind of thing. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, reports of other aldermen, Alderman Kramer, or sorry, Alderman Dimmitt. Thank My you, Mr. Colleges. Chairman. Uh, Ways and Means will be canceled this week for lack of a quorum. Alderman Kramer? No report. Alderman Leahy? Two items, Your Honor. The Ward 3 meeting for the month of October will be Tuesday night, the 30th of October, here in the Council Room at 7 p.m. Um, all are invited. But more importantly, um, this Saturday, October the 6th is the Lily Fun Fair up at St. Mary Magdalene. Lily La Martina is the young lady who is five years old that has been fighting leukemia, and they are raising money for her Make-A-Wish Foundation to help cover the cost of sending her and her family down to Disney World for a week. So if you're available on Saturday the 6th of October from 12 noon to 3 p.m. at the St. Mary Magdalene parking lot, Come up and participate in the fun and games and help us raise funds to make a wish possible. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And I'll just say I, I, got, uh, I had the pleasure of attending a, uh, the, the ceremony that Mary Magdalene held for Lily to present her with her uh, make a wish. And uh, she's just uh, cute as all get out and just thrilled to be going to Disney. It was so funny to see all the kindergartners dressed in the princess dresses. <laughs> I, I remember those days, and but you, you know you see them come back vividly when there's 20 little girls running around in princess dresses. So, anyway, uh, it's it's a great cause, and if you have a chance to get out and support it, and a chance to meet Lily, uh, well worth the time. Uh, Alderman Lockmiller. Yes, the Public Works Committee will meet here October 10th at 4:30 in this room. Uh, we'll take up uh, well, a presentation by our city administrator on the new customer service project. Uh, we'll take up the flailing sewer lateral program and uh, get an update on recycling. All good stuff. Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> uh, Alderman O'Neill. Uh, yes, yeah, several items from the library Go ahead. board meeting downstairs. Um, the new children's librarian has moved to Colorado to join two other Brentwood librarians who have moved to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> So um, they are now advertising for another qualified children's librarian. Um, in the meantime, they're doing some programming. And November 13th, Shannon Messenger, who is a young adult and children's author, is going to speak. They're using the um, school administration because they know it will be a big deal. So 180 seats, tickets are free, but you need to get tickets on Eventbrite. So if you see that advertised, that's what that is. And um, last, the, the new monthly adult series, Just for Fun, started last week. And there were some new faces and a great many people enjoying Earthbound Beer and Pappy's Smokehouse <laughs> Barbecue. Um, next month, November 19 at 6.30 after the library closes. And the idea is read a horror book and then come <laughs> mingle and discuss it and have dinner there too. So all adults are welcome. Fantastic. Stephen King, beer and barbecue. You can't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. Uh, yeah, probably in that order. I know, but um, Alderman Plefka. Uh, no report. Alderman Sims. No report. Alderman Wagy. No report. All right. 
Uh, Madam City Administrator, do you have a report this evening? Uh, thank does. you, Mayor Thornton. Tomorrow is a National Night Out in the City of Brentwood. It starts at 5.30. I believe there are approximately, Chief, 10 parties? 10, maybe 11 block parties. Um, locations are on the city website, also on next door. The Alderman, Mayor Thornton, staff, and the police chief, Chief Spies, um, Dan, um, a lot of us will be going around throughout the city, um, interacting with our residents and uh, talking about how we continue to be safe uh, going forward. So we're looking forward to that tomorrow. Um, the other report is our monthly Manchester Renewal City Administrator update, and Craig Schluter is here to present. Good evening. My name is Craig Schluter with Navigate. Um, so the city administrator update is changing a little bit. Uh, we used to present it about a month or two months behind with the summer schedule after you all had already approved the warrant list. And uh, through discussion, we decided to have it at the same speed as a warrant list. So that way, the costs that you guys are seeing and approving tonight are also being demonstrated in the categories that I'm presenting. So that way you just know how the costs are being categorized so you all can just review them more effectively and improve that warrant list. So um, the investment costs for the period up to October 1st, uh, there are no investment costs spent. Uh, so the amount uh, to date is $707,270.37. The direct project costs, um, so the recent direct project costs include Manchester Road Improvements Design, the Deer Creek Flood Mitigation Design, uh, the environmental studies, and some zoning and development materials for the impact group. So the total cost spent to date is $1,006,466.92. And the last category is the indirect or sunk costs. Um, those costs uh, include the property acquisition legal fees, uh, design contract legal fees, project management costs, and property survey costs. So the total cost to date is $633,925.47. So that's it for the overall expenditures. Um, one other uh, quick update. We had talked about the uh, East-West Gateway SWT grant, and uh, we had said that the city uh, had been recommended funding for that $1.2 million. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of steps that have gotten up to where we are today in October, and uh, nothing has taken us off the course. So we believe that the Board of Directors should still be following suit with Brentwood receiving that grant by end of October, which is $1.2 million. So hopefully uh, the first meeting, the first Board of Alderman meeting in November, we could be presenting more good news of, of the city receiving an additional $1.2 million in grants, so. Hey Craig, are we gonna receive the, the update on the numbers in some way other than verbally? It's in your it's in your board packet. The warrant list? Not? No, it it's is not. not. No. We typically put it in there, so I think we missed it this week. Yeah. We'll okay. upload it after the meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have received some questions from the alderman regarding our project, and um, it, it does take a, a little time to kind of pull them all together because I have to go back to the individual meeting minutes and extract that information. But I believe I responded to the first question last week. But going forward, the responses would be will be in my weekly um, weekly report that goes out every Friday. So there should be one this Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything further? No, thank you. All right. Uh, item number nine on tonight's agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, on our consent agenda tonight, we have the minutes of the September 4th meeting. Uh, we have resolution number 102 concerning the agreement with McMillan Lum uh, sorry, Millman Lumber. Uh, we have resolution 106, the Brentwood Re Complex Door Access Project, uh, which involves getting uh, electronic access to the Brentwood Recreation Complex. Uh, I, uh, resolution 1113 regarding the Brentwood Park Playground Project. And resolution number 1114, Proposition D, oh, sorry, that one's been moved and the warrant list. Uh, does anybody want to discuss or have any questions about anything on the war uh, consent agenda? Sorry. Okay, seeing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted? So motion moved. to approve as submitted. And moved yeah. and seconded. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call please. 
Alderman Dimmitt? Yes. Alderman Kramer? Yes. Alderman Leahy? No. Alderman Lockmiller? Yes. Alderwoman O'Neill? Yes. Alderman Plufka? Yes. Alderwoman Sims? Yes. And Alderman Wiggy? Yes. I'm sorry, Alderman Wiggy, was that a yes or no? Yes. Okay. It was. Oh, yes. I share the motion carries by a vote of seven to one. Uh, item number 10 is old business. On old business this evening, we have the second reading of bill number 6220. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, can we have the second reading by title only, please? Bill number 6220, second reading and consideration for adoption. An ordinance to update and implement employee compensation plans for the City of Brentwood, Missouri, beginning in fiscal year 2019 and related matters. Thank you. Could I have a motion to perfect, please? Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to amend uh, Bill 6220 to uh, increase the, our philosophy for uniform workers from the 75th percentile to the 95th percentile. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that the Bill 6220 be, uh, sorry, 6220, yeah, 6220 be amended to I'm sorry, increase, increase the public safety personnel or the uniform personnel right. from the 75th percentile to the 95th percentile. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, as, as many of you know, <clears throat> this, um, this topic has been around for a while and uh, we had a, a discussion at the last meeting with uh, Linda Higby. Uh, just to recap, to increase our first responders or uniformed workers, uh, right now we have to, uh, we're going to have to spend $12,000 to get to the 75th percentile. What Linda Higby told us at the last meeting is to get us up to the 95th percentile, it would simply take an additional $43,000. One-time expenditure is what she said. I am, I've made this motion, and I know there's some of you who support this motion, so really what I'm about to say is directed to those who are on the fence or who are, who are opposed to it. I think there's a number of reasons that we should do this. Uh, first, the gentleman who stood up and talked about the makeup of our fire department, and I think it's probably not limited just to the fire department, but it's probably the police department as well. I think that both of them are top heavy. Um, what he, what he said is, I think, uh, something like 13 of our firemen have 16 years or more of experience. I think there's one that has 11 years, and then there's seven that have five or less. And of those seven, uh, only one has five years experience. The others have one year or less. So as those <clears throat> top firefighters, the guys with, or the firefighters that have the uh, 16 years or more of experience as they start retiring we're going to be looking more and more to the youth of our fire department what we don't want is to have them to start start leaving and going to other departments other municipalities like that gentleman said we don't want this to become a training ground we're going to be relying heavily on the youth of our fire department and I'm sure the same thing is true with our uh, with our police department and I, I know somebody had said you're trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist I disagree with that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we're having a mass exodus. Uh, I have no reason to, to believe that. However, I'm trying to prevent a problem from existing in the first place. When you look at what some of these municipalities are doing, I think it's, it's logical to conclude that the next step is going to be some of our, our younger guys, they see that they can maybe make some more money going to a neighboring municipality, and they say we're going to do that. And then we have to fill it and we have to start all over. And that gets me to the second reason why I'm in favor of this. Uh, and that is to uh, increase the probability that we're gonna have quality candidates to fill spots. Uh, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if you, if you pay a good salary, you're gonna get good workers. And right now, we're at the 75th percentile. If we're at the 95th, I think we're going to have, I would imagine we're going to have a lot of 
really, really good people trying to, f to come and fill these positions. Um, anecdotally, I just had a spot in my office that had to be filled. And so I ran an ad, and I had over 100 people submitting resumes. I looked at those. After I got done looking at them, I had maybe three people who I even wanted to meet with. And the reason for that is I wasn't paying as much. I needed to pay more to get quality candidates. And I want this to be a problem for our two chiefs when they have to hire somebody. I don't want them to be faced with a situation that they have three or four good candidates. I want them to have to make a, have a really tough decision. They have 10 highly qualified candidates. When these guys are leaving, these, these men and women are leaving police academies, I want them to say, we want to go to Brentwood. We're going to get the best. We'll get the brightest if we do this. The third reason is I think it's what the residents want us to do. And we passed Prop P, and it, it passed overwhelmingly. And I know from just reading articles, I know from talking to residents in Brentwood, their expectation is that we take some of that money and we distribute it, we pay it in the form of raises to our police and fire. I don't know how we go back to the voters and say, yeah, you guys did this, that was your expectation, but we're not going to spend it on that. And the last thing that I want to say is, when I was talking to one of you, I don't recall who it was, somebody made a comment to me that, you know, the 75th percentile is not a slap in the face. I said, you're right. But it is the bare minimum. It is the bare minimum that we can do. It's the least amount that we can pay to come up with a competitive salary for our first responders. I think we can do better. I think we should do better. And I think if you guys, if you all really think about it, you will agree with me. You've done that before. You don't have to look any further than last year when the issue of streetlights came up. This board approved that he purchased an installation of 35 streetlights. And at that time, Dan stood right there at that podium. And he said, we can put in wooden utility poles with cobra head lights attached to them. And that would satisfy the purpose to illuminate the streets. But this board wasn't satisfied with that. This board wanted better lights. This board wanted architecturally pleasing lights. So this board approved the spending of thousands of additional dollars to go with that. This board was not satisfied with the bare minimum of <coughs> cobra head lights <coughs> stuck on a wooden utility pole. This board wanted to do better. And that's what we're faced with tonight. We can stay at the bare minimum or we can do better. I think we, we owe it to our residents. I think we owe it to our first responders. I hear this board uh, give praise to their actions time and time again when they've, when they've done something and we've, we've acknowledged that, all in the name of supporting our police and fire. My suggestion is if we really want to show them how much we appreciate what they do, really show how much we support them, we would support this motion and do it unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Plufkin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I seconded this motion uh, for a lot of the reasons that Dave's already articulated. I'm just going to add one more, um, and that is that, that you don't have to spend too much time on public safety or too much time reading the paper or too much time looking at um, social media to understand that Brentwood um, is on the front lines of uh, increasing amounts of crime and crime that is increasingly violent. Um, if we want to maintain this community as a place where people want to live, shop, uh, and, um, and work, uh, we are going to have to pay attention to this issue. We have to make people feel safe in our, uh, um, in our commercial districts. We have to make people feel safe in their neighborhoods, and that's only going to happen when we have the best and the brightest protecting us both from a standpoint of fire safety 
and against crime. And um, to Dave's point, we can afford to do this. Um, I, I believe we should be spending our money. This should be a priority for us because, um, as we all know, sales tax is the lifeblood of this community. And um, if we see that drop, if people find that shopping in Brentwood is not such a great thing anymore because of crime, of shoplifting, of other types of crime against property, uh, that they're going to go elsewhere to to shop, we're going to feel that. Um, we're also going to feel it when our property values uh, begin to drop um, because of anecdotal stories about um, people being harassed in our neighborhoods. Um, Chief Spies, I've seen um, Chief McIntyre when he was interim, when he was a chief, and I've seen through continued through Joe's efforts. Um, he has put us, I think, on a path to fight this crime in the best ways we know how, using the best technology we, that we have, um, and that requires officers that are um, up on all of these different technologies and ways of, of, of um, protecting and serving our community. And as we see our more mature officers um, retire, and as we have to go to replace them, uh, I'd like us to have every tool in the in the toolbox, so to speak, um, to uh, get the best and the brightest and make this be an attractive place where firefighters and police officers want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Lockmiller. I've heard it mentioned best and brightest, and it seems to be just revolving around salary. And I think the best and brightest look at other things just beyond pay. I think they look at our benefits. We match and exceed in a couple of areas of disability and sick leave uh, other cities. Uh, I think they look at the leadership up at the top end and the training that they're given. If I was coming to work here, um, I'd look at the legislative board. Are they supportive of police and fire, which I believe we are. I believe any equipment they want, we try to give them. Um, citizen support. I think the citizens support them 500% right now. And as long as, and with the hiring that we've done at the 75 percentile, I think we've gotten the best and the brightest so far. I think our new police chief has brought in some people that are excellent. We've kept our assistant fire chief moved up to be our chief and kept the assistant. So I'm thinking there's more than just pay involved when you want to attract the best and the brightest. Thank you. Alderman Leahy. Thank you, Your Honor. This issue of pay has been wrestled with for a good five, four years before we went into a comp compensation plan that we approved of. Part of the compensation discussion about pay, we took the uniformed employees and we gave them a step plan that runs seven years instead of the 12 years that you plan with the rest of the employees. Um, Part of the argument that we had with working at trying to get into a comparable arrangement versus the way we were proceeding at yearly reviews and working out the cost of what pay increases would be was to try to find a way to put a financial handle on all this. In those discussions, the union came to us and pointed out, and so did the chiefs, that if we didn't go to the quicker step plans that we would be that training ground and that we would lose employees over the over the years because they could make more somewhere else. So we agreed to the seven year plan. I believe Jason, I think you all had all of the applications from the prior positions that are come in. We have not had a position that we could not fill because we got a good number of applicants that would apply for what we're doing and we're paying and at that time, we have slowly dropped to the 75% percentile level. I think that to destroy the compensation plan and bump it back up right now, I don't think we've given the, what we fought so hard to get in place a chance to really work for us. I don't think it's the right decision overall. If you wanted to go for best and brightest for everybody, Let's pay everybody 100% and 10% above everybody other, other, every other community that's out there. And let's not do it just for police and fire, but cover all your positions so that all your personnel is best and brightest. 
throwing money at it, I don't think is the right answer. I think working within the community and working within the bounds of what staff is given to work with, we can accomplish and still maintain a very well community without throwing more money out at things. The 43,000 that we're looking at that Mrs. Uh, Higby mentioned, I think last uh, two weeks ago, is basically what we are trying to be saving each year by not throwing all of our reviews to a, well, what do you want to give everybody? 2%, 3%? work it this way. We're trying to work that savings in, and I don't think that's going to break the bank, but to throw the plan out four years into it isn't a good solution either. So I'm not in favor of going to a 95 percentile for just the uniform employees. Thank you. Otherwoman O'Neill. All right, I, I have a comment and a question for our city administrator. Um, I'm always in favor of the underdog, and I look at this, and, and those are really well thought out, well rehearsed speeches, rousing as they are. And I agree, we have wonderful people on both the police and uh, fire staffs. But I look at their salaries, and then I look at what we are paying the people who are coming around in the heat and the cold to pick up our trash, and certainly it does not involve as much skill, but it's also half the salary. So to, to increase this, and not across the board somehow is an emotional thing, but I, it doesn't quite seem fair when there has been a procedure set in place a few years ago. Um, my question for Bola then, um, if Mr. Youngblood named all of these towns that have a higher pay range than we do, we can't possibly be 75th percentile if that many are on top of us. So. So what actually, can, can we have some enlightenment? Where are we really with, with we, this? We are at the 75th percentile. I did not write down the list of the places he named. I don't know if they're all municipalities or if some of them are districts. So, um, but we have never attempted to benchmark ourselves to districts. So uh, let, me, let me help Clarify answer that, that question. So uh, we, the 75th percentile in Brentwood is determined with respect to a comparator group that we have already defined. Mm -hmm. That comparator group consists of Clayton, Maplewood, Chesterfield, Ellisville, Richmond Heights, Ladue, Baldwin, De Pere, Webster Grove, Frontenac, Kirkwood, Maryland Heights, and Town and Country. Mm -hmm. When we say that we're at the 75th percentile, we mean that we are at the 75th percentile with respect to those 14 and only those 14 cities. Now, I can tell you from looking at the data <laughs> that if you're at the 75th percentile of those cities, you are well and above the 75th percentile of any other municipality in the St. Louis area. Okay. Municipality. That's absolutely true. Different for fire. That, Alderman Dip. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to follow up or, or comment on some of the, the statements made. Uh, Alderman Lockmuller, I asked Linda at the meeting about the benefits. And what she said was, in some areas we do exceed, in some other areas we lag. But overall, what she said is, we're right in line with all the other municipalities uh, in the comparator cities. So I, I don't think that we can hold out the benefits and say, that's an inducement for somebody to come here because they're gonna get better benefits coming to the city of Brentwood than they would by going to any other comparators. The facts just don't support that. Uh, I also I agree with you. You know, we, we're fortunate with our with our upper management. We've got terrific chiefs. In the real world, I don't know how much that really affects people in making their choices. I can only talk from the world of, of law firms. I'm in a small law firm. Uh, my wife's in a very big law firm, and and I can tell you that uh, you know the big law firms they get the absolute best out of law school. And it's not because of who's running that law firm. It's not because their uh, vacation package is better than anybody else. It's because of what they pay, plain and simple. And I really do think that uh, that's going to be the case here. If we raise this, what I think is an inconsequential amount of money, when you look at a $20 million budget and we've got 430 or 460,000 coming in on Prop P, 200,000 is earmarked for those two new positions. We're, we're talking about over 200,000 extra dollars 
annually if we don't use it for that i don't know what what we use it for you know you say ammunition we were buying ammunition all along it's coming out of the budget that's nothing nothing extra you know the question isn't why the question is why not do it we have the means to do this the voters want us to do this and i just I, i'm at a complete loss why somebody would not support this alderman Leahy, you're mm -hmm. you're you know throwing money out i don't take it as though we're throwing money out we're we're paying for their services these these firemen and these police officers who are putting their lives on the line i I don't care how much we pay them. I would never categorize it as though we're throwing money out of them. We're getting something valuable in return for what we are paying. And I also take issue with your, your statement that we're destroying this compensation plan. No, we are not. Absolutely not. We still have the compensation plan. We got, it's a market-based compensation plan. All, all I'm wanting to do, and all I think Alderman Plufka is wanting to do, is to change our philosophy from the 75th percentile to the 95th percentile. So instead of three municipalities paying more than us for any of these given positions, it'd be one municipality that pays more than us. And this idea that we could just pay, lead the market and throw 10% on top of that, yeah, you're right, but that's not responsible. Well, that's what you're no, offering. No, it's, no it is it is not. Then you do not understand the compensation plan. If you think that's what I'm offering, I think it's pretty crystal clear what I'm suggesting here. 95th percentile is not leading the market. It is making sure you have a municipality on top of you that keeps you from leading the market. That's why you don't want to lead the market. That's the safeguard. That's why I'm not suggesting we do lead the market. 95th percentile, we have one municipality above us. That keeps us in check. Other Malay. Forgive me for being rude. That, I, I, I was I should, about to I call should, you out of order, so but you, you checked right. yourself, okay. so don't, no problem. One municipality being above us is a check, and at seventy-five percent, as you point out, three municipalities are above us, and that's a check. My argument at throwing money is that your intent is if I raise everybody's pay to the ninety-fifth percentile, I get better firefighters, better policemen. Well, if that be the real argument, let's pay everybody one hundred and ten percent and nobody gets anything less. When we went to the step plan, we argued why do we need to go from a 12-year plan down to a seven-year plan, because we were afraid we would be that training ground and lose that those employees after they figured they could go somewhere else to get better pay and could earn money faster. Money isn't the whole answer. And just throwing money at the pay to assume that we get better personnel is an emotional argument also. I think the fact that we spent four years fighting to get into this compensation arrangement is justifiably enough that we not tear it apart by gutting it. And I think that's what this motion is going to do, is to start gutting. Next year, will you be here to tell me that my trash collectors, my city rec people, and my public works people should get that same 95% so we don't lose them and we keep the city looking pleasant and the trash picked up? Because that's the argument you're giving me, and I'm going, no. I think we need to be able to manage the money that comes in here and responsibly allocate it out to provide the services that we have. And it's working. Thus, gutting it shouldn't happen. Thank you, Your Honor. Alderman Plefka. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, with all due respect, Alderman Leahy, the, 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 the difference here is that is that firefighters and police officers have a direct impact on on how our commercial districts and how our neighborhoods um, are and how they're perceived and um, they have a much greater impact the delivery of those services has a much greater impact on a, a, a city like Brentwood we are in I would suggest a fragile situation where we are a border community where we have increasing reports of crime spilling over into our community, into Maplewood, into Richmond Heights, into Ladue, into all those communities. And, and I applaud uh, Chief Spees in the efforts that he has made uh, to, to, meet those, to meet those concerns. And they are growing concerns. And they continue to grow. And they're not going the other way. And I believe that one of the reasons why this is um, a 
a, a good motion is that this gives our chief, Chief Spee specifically, an additional tool with which to be as effective as possible, and that is to offer um, financially, along with everything else, along with great leadership, along with uh, a, the department that is functioning well, along with a citizenry that respects and applauds their efforts, along with a staff that does a great job in supporting them. Uh, you're right, it isn't all about money, but money is a component part of this. Um, and I, I, I believe that Alderman Dimmitt's motion is right on. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, the motion is for, uh, sorry, the motion on the table is the amendment of Bill 6220 to go from the 75th percentile to the 95th percentile for public safety or uniform employees, which I take it to be just the seventh step plan. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So does everybody understand the motion? A vote in favor is to make the amendment. A vote against is to deny the amendment. Uh, roll call, please. Alderman Dimmitt? Yes. Alderman Kramer? No. Alderman Leahy? No. Alderman Lockmiller? No. Alderwoman O'Neill? No. Alderman Plufka? Yes. Alderwoman Sims? Yes. And Alderman Wingy? Yes. Uh, my count is 4 4 on that. Uh, well, I will tell you that Alderman Dimmitt did give me a heads up that he was going to be making this motion this evening, so I've had some time to think about this. And um, before I tell you how I'm going to vote, I want to tell you why I'm going to vote the way I do. Okay? But it's going to take a little while, so uh, you asked for it, you got it. Uh, so sit back. Uh, <laughs> It's not going to take that long, but, but I, want, I want you to really understand my reasoning because I think it's important. Okay? Um, when I ran for mayor in 2015 and got elected, uh, one of the very first uh, mayor's happy hours that I had, uh, Matt Saunders came and he said to me, what is the biggest problem facing Brentwood? And I answered at that meeting, I answered that it was our, uh, our employee compensation. And the reason I answered that way is because at that point in time, we had a payroll of about $7.5 million. Okay? It was increasing at about 3% a year. Okay? And I quickly did the math on that. And when you compound 3% on a $7.5 million payroll, it doesn't take very long for that payroll to become a really significant part of your budget. And, and quite frankly, I found it to be unsustainable. If you don't have the, the, the only reason that we were able to continue that as long as we had is because we had substantial revenue growth over that time. Had we not had re revenue growth over that time, we would not have had sustainability on that type of payroll plan. It just would, couldn't have happened. And so quite frankly, I, I thought that that was our biggest problem because that threatened our financial wherewithal as a city. Um, at that time, most of the positions in the city were paid more than any other worker doing the same job in any other municipality in St. Louis. Okay, I want to say that again. Most of the people in Brentwood were being paid more to do the exact same job than any other person doing the same job for any other municipality in St. Louis. We weren't just 75th percentile, 95th percentile with respect to 14 comparator cities. We were number one in the entire metro area at almost every single position in the city. Okay? When I went and looked at the payroll structure that we had in place, uh, there was no discernible rationale at all in the payroll structure. Right? We had some positions, clerk positions, presumably entry-level clerk positions. When you looked at the job description, you said, this is a clerk, that were making as much as $70,000 a year. Meanwhile, we had skilled positions <laughs> Uh, that required, you know, semi-professional degrees that were making less than that. It, there was no rhyme or reason to it at all. The only thing that was consistent throughout is that every single position was making far and away a higher salary than any comparable position in any other city. Okay? 
Furthermore, there was no limit. There was no practical limit on any position, right? So every single position could continue to make more and more and more money ad infinitum. All you had to do was be in that position or be in a similar position or a higher position and you could make more and more and more money. So there was literally no limit to what you could earn as a Brentwood employee, okay? Again, my concern with that situation is not that it's unfair, and I certainly don't begrudge any of the people who are making those salaries. Look, we're all driven by economics. We all want to earn as much money as we possibly can, and if somebody offers you more money, you certainly take it. I recommend it every time and twice on Sunday. To the extent that we had a compensation philosophy, the philosophy seemed to be that there was no limit to what we could do to pay our employees, okay? So in addition to paying the highest salary of any place in the St. Louis area, we had all sorts of other things that were sweeteners, right? We had a longevity program, which paid people more the longer they were here. We had an attendance program, which paid people more the fewer sick days they took. We had uh, annual raises. We had nearly unlimited accumulation of sick and vacation, which was paid out at retirement. And when I say nearly unlimited, I'm not kidding. Literally unlimited. You could just bring up all your sick and all your vacation for all the years you worked here, and you could turn it in like a bond at the end of your employment with the city of Brentwood. And again, I don't begrudge the people who got these things, these things, good for them. But it, it, it's absolutely unsustainable as a payroll program for a city. It's absolutely can't be sustained. The only reason we were able to do it for as long as we did is because our revenues were increasing. And the minute those revenues start to level off, you can't do those things. It's not sustainable. I was told by people who had been here longer than I had, that we had the best employees because we paid the most. Well, we certainly paid the most, but unfortunately, what I saw around me did not comport with the idea that we had the best employees. And that was my frank, honest analysis of where we were at at that point in time. Okay? What I observed was that we had kind of a a dysfunctional culture. I've, I've, I've called it a culture of entitlement. All right? Our, our culture at that point in time was one of employee entitlement. What can you do for me? What have you done for me? I don't like this. Make it change. It was not a culture where we had uh, a, a customer service attitude. It was not a culture where we solved problems. It was a culture where we quite frankly, spent an awful lot of time arguing amongst ourselves and, and <laughs> engaged in the most ridiculous activities instead of serving the people that we were hired to serve. Employees were committed to, permitted to create the jobs that they wanted. They were allowed to ignore tasks that they didn't feel necessary or didn't like. The workforce of 100 and plus employees were adamantly opposed to any form of control or accountability. And as an example of that, I will tell you that shortly before I got here, it took us two years, two years, to implement a time tracking system for people who are paid by the hour. People who were paid by the hour resisted a time tracking system for more than two years. It seemed to me that when we ran out of ways to compensate our employees, what we did was we said, okay, well we can show you our appreciation by indulging you in any manner we can. So what I saw was Things like admitted felonies, inadvertent embezzlement, time card fraud, petty theft, misuse of city equipment. All of this stuff was ignored. It was nodded at, winked at. 
the prevailing philosophy seemed to be if nobody called you on it, it was fine. I'm sorry, but that's what I saw, folks. In spite of all this, we didn't seem to have very happy employees. I will tell you that in my first year as mayor, I probably got more complaints from employees than I did from our citizens. And this was while Man or Brentwood Boulevard was being resurfaced. The most troubling thing that I saw was it seemed like we didn't have a whole lot of dedication to doing our jobs at all, to be perfectly honest. Our urban forest was completely unmaintained, despite the fact that we had an arborist on staff and people who, you're nodding your head, David. I mean, you know, you saw what I saw. We hadn't touched it. Our resident neighborhoods were not being effectively patrolled by our police force. Our public safety ordinances were not being consistently enforced at all. We found three abandoned vehicles and God knows how many car batteries in the back of I don't know how many yards that had been there for years and years. We, couldn't, we could not enforce our own ordinances, folks. We didn't have a customer service mentality that I would think that the most talented workforce would have when it comes to what you're, what you're hired to do is essentially customer service job. Yeah, okay, the police people would come, the police force would come when they were called, the fire trucks came, the ambulance came when they were called, and the trash was picked up regularly. And just before I got elected, we took a survey of what services were most highly ranked in Brentwood, and the number one service in Brentwood ranked by our citizens at that point in time, 2015, was trash. You know why? That's what happened most regularly. <laughs> it got picked up. I personally observed police patrol vehicles parked for hours behind buildings, only blocks from the police station. I recorded a 12 hour period where six officers were on duty and only once left the station. That to respond to a single call in August of 2016. Other than that, they never left the station in a 12 hour shift. We were broke, folks. There ain't no doubt about it. We had a broken system. And the reason I mention all this is not because I want to embarrass anybody. Honest to God, it's not. Because if I wanted to embarrass people, I could have mentioned it at the time. I want to change it. <laughs> and I want to tell you why it doesn't work. Okay? I don't think that embarrassing people or bringing them up and dressing them down in front of the public helps the situation, all right? What I think helps the situation is to change the way we work, to change our culture, right? To make it so that we all want to work together to get the job done. Because I think that's what the people want us to do. I think the people want us to they want public safety. I heard somebody say, well, the police, they want us to spend money. I don't think they care how much we pay our police force. I don't think they care how much we pay our fire force. I think they want public safety. They want the public to be safe. They want us to do the job. And what I chose to focus on when I saw all of this in front of me was changing our culture and changing our organization so that we could focus on doing the job. A good example of this is right across the street. And I know there's been a lot of talk about this lately. It's the firehouse, okay? I was elected in April. By June, Ted Jury sitting in my office telling me about all these problems with the fire department. And I'm looking at him going, 
you mean the brand new fire department <laughs> right across the street, out my window? Yeah. I said, well, what are the problems? And he says, well, there's electrical problems, there's high humidity, there's lack of temperature control, there's sanitation issues. <laughs> the list went on and on. There's no elevator. And I, excuse me, and I told Ted, I said, Ted, how in the world? And he said, look, I wasn't here. I don't know. But they have to be fixed. And I said, OK. What can we do to make this a better place for our firemen, right? What, how, do we, how do we fix that problem? To my way of thinking, the big problem is not that all of this happened. It's a problem. But finding out how it happened isn't really important. What's really important is finding out how to fix it, right? So I told Ted, go, get engineering estimates. Do what you need to do, put together a plan to fix it. He said, okay, but it's gonna be expensive. I said, I understand that, right? I asked our city attorney to look into holding people accountable, how we got into this mess, right? But my big concern was fixing the issue, right? Because when our city attorney came back and he said to me, he said, yeah, we might be able to go after the architect, right? And there's some chance that we could prevail if we do, right? I was sure of one thing. Suing the architect wasn't gonna make the firehouse any better. It wasn't gonna fix the problem. All it was gonna do is maybe make us feel better, but it wasn't gonna actually fix the problem, which is the firehouse couldn't be kept below 75 degrees and 100% humidity on a summer day. And by the way, once we dug into it, we found that, oh, that 75 degrees and high humidity was a perfect environment for mold. And the entire upper floor of the fire department was covered in mold. And again, frustrated? Yes. Did I want to scream? Yes. What do you do? You fix it. <laughs> Our firemen can't live in a building that's infested with mold. We have to fix it. So. I didn't order an investigation into what the hell happened and who signed what, and you know, we looked at it. But, but that wouldn't have solved the problem. What solved the problem was going and rearranging the budget and trying to figure out how to make the money available to fix the situation and take care of the safety of our employees and take care of the fire station. That's what was important. And I think that's what's important to the citizens of Brentwood. I think that's what they would have wanted me to do. Otherwise, I would have done something else. I'm going to tell you about one of the people who was involved in that situation, by the way, because I think he deserves special mention. He's the owner of Reinhold Electric. Okay? We talked to all of the contractors that worked on the fire station, all the faulty systems. right? We, try, we asked them to come in and look at the work that their company had done right? and say, hey, why did you do this? How come this doesn't work? Right? One contractor came in, and he looked at the work that was done. And he told us right then and there, he was embarrassed that his company had done that. Within a week, he had a team of his people working on our fire station at his own expense. And in three weeks, all of the electrical problems were corrected and no charge to the city of Brentwood, just an apology from the owner. I say that because in contrast, there were several other contractors who worked on the project who didn't quite take that point of view. And so what we had to do was we had to decide whether we wanted to spend our time and effort suing those people or we wanted to spend our time and effort fixing the problem. And at the end of the day, what we did was we focused on fixing the problem. We didn't forget about the possibility of suing them, but we just <coughs> focused on fixing the problem. It cost, in the end of the day, 850-some thousand dollars. Was I disappointed? Was I upset? Yep. Should it have happened? Nope. Unfortunately, it's possible that some of our own Brentwood employees were involved in making some of these decisions that led to these problems. I can't say definitively one way or the other, but neither can anybody else. And the problem is when you go to court, you have to be able to be more than 50% right.
I told that story for one, well, for a couple of reasons. One is to illustrate for you that my philosophy when encountering issues like this is to focus on solving the problem, right? I don't like to talk about who did what because it doesn't really serve what I think is the citizen's interests. What serves the citizen's interest is taking care of business and getting it done right. Um, but I will point out that at the time the firehouse was being built, we were paying the highest of any municipality in the St. Louis area. And presumably that meant that we had the best and brightest people all across the board. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you that my belief is that high compensation doesn't guarantee high performance. It may help. It may increase your likelihood of getting high performance. It doesn't guarantee. I don't think it ever has, and I don't think it ever will. <clears throat> As I said, one of the things that I set out to do was change our culture of entitlement. And one of the most important things I did, or I recommended, and I worked with a lot of folks in this room to get done, was to change our compensation system such that we move away from subjective and political pressures to do things and focus more on objective rationale for doing things. Okay. At a ma as a matter of policy, when we set our when we set our uh, when we set our compensation level at the 75th percentile. Um, you know, what we, what we were trying to do is we were trying to be competitive. And I, I will tell you, absolutely, folks, it, you, you can come see the data anytime you want. If you're at the 75th percentile of our 14 comparator cities, you are at way above the 75th percentile for St. Louis metro area as a whole. All right? Our 14 comparator cities are the top municipalities in St. Louis. So by being at the 75th percentile of those, you're well above anybody else in the St. Louis area. Literally, there are only three or four other cities in the St. Louis area that are paying more for that exact same job than the city of Brentwood. The idea was that we would, we would maybe never be the highest, but we would certainly never be the lowest, and we would be in a position to pay a very competitive wage. Right, without having to keep up with whatever city happens to decide to, for whatever reason, uh, you know, go out and start doing things differently. Uh, not everybody was thrilled with the plan when we went with the 75th percentile, and some of the most outspoken critics are in this room. Mr. Youngblood, Mr. Niemeyer, uh, the fire department, they didn't like it. Uh, they felt that we needed to go with the 95th percentile. Uh, at the time, I recall telling them that I thought the decision was more or less arbitrary. That as long as we put a cap in place, that most of the things that you want to achieve by doing a salary structure the way we put it in place uh, could be achieved. Right? Um, and I think that I still today believe that's somewhat true. Okay. Um, but in all of the discussion, and don't worry, I'm getting close to the end. In all of the discussion that we've had here this evening, I have not heard what I consider to be the most important questions asked or answered, okay? So the most important question is, how does it benefit the citizens of Brentwood to pay the public safety folks in this town at the 95th percentile rather than the 75th percentile? How does it benefit them? What tangible benefit will they get from it? 
I've heard the assumption that you hire the best and the brightest that way, and I've already told you, I don't, I don't believe that compensation alone will guarantee you performance. Okay? If there is such a benefit, which I haven't heard, then why don't we want that benefit across the board? Why, why do we not want to hire the best and brightest financial control officer that we can get? I would argue to you that financial controls are almost as important as public safety when it comes to running a municipality. If there is such a benefit to be had by paying at the 95th percentile, why do we not want it across the board? I haven't heard an answer to that either. All of the arguments I've heard tonight boil down to two things. One is we can afford to do it. In fact, I think Alderman Pluff has said exactly that. We can afford to do it. That's always true. We're blessed in Brentwood. <laughs> we sp the money we spend every year, less than 25% of it comes from people who actually live here. We can afford to do it, right? And the second reason is, is because the employees want it. Well, as I said, I, I understand that and I agree with it. Employees always want more money. In my opinion, because we can afford it is not a good reason, and because they want it is not a good reason to do something. There has to be a tangible reason, a tangible benefit to the citizens of Brentwood for us to spend the money that we've been entrusted to spend on their behalf. And I won't say their money, because it's not. <laughs> it is once we collect it, but it doesn't happen. The bottom line is I don't see any objective reason that we should go from the 75th percentile to the 95th percentile. Uh, my conclusion is, is that the reason we're proposing this is because we want to accommodate the public safety's employees' requests to be paid more. And because the city has the financial means to do it. I don't think those are good reasons to do that. I also think they're going to perpetuate the culture of entitlement that I think I've explained to you and that I think that we would do well to get rid of. I'm sorry to disappoint the fire department, the police department, uh, but my vote, uh, I believe it's my duty to vote on behalf of the citizens, no. Do we have a motion on the floor for Bill 6220? Uh, take a motion to perfect. Motion to perfect. The, the, well, sorry. So with my vote, the motion to amend fails. We need a motion to perfect the bill as submitted. Motion to perfect Bill 6220 as submitted. <coughs> Second. Moved and seconded to perfect Bill 6220 as submitted. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Alderman Dimmitt? No. Alderman Kramer? Yes. Alderman Leahy? Yes. Alderman Lockmiller? Yes. Alderwoman O'Neill? Yes. Alderman Plucka? Yes. Alderwoman Sims? Yes. And Alderman Wiggy? Yes. Bill number 6220 passes, and upon signature of the mayor, becomes ordinance number 4859. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see. We had one other item on new agenda. It was resolution 1150, I believe. 05, sir. 1105? Yes, sir. Thank you. No, we have 6222 first. We just did that one. No, we didn't. No, no. no we didn't. I'm sorry. 6220. Uh, 11A. It's that the, was old business. Oh, it's the contract. Two, two, two. Yeah. Oh, my fault. I'm sorry. Yeah, we were under new. I, my, my mistake. We got off. Uh, so I, uh, under item number 11, new business, we have bill number 6222, uh, an employment agreement. Mr. City Attorney, can we have the first reading by title only, please? Bill number 6222, first reading, an ordinance authorizing the mayor acting on behalf of the city of Brentwood, Missouri, 
execute an agreement with the fire chief of the city of Brentwood, Missouri, and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the first reading, so we have a chance for questions. Do we have a presentation on this one, or shall I just take it? Let me, let me tell you where this is coming from, folks, this, and I, the board is already uh, aware of this. Uh, when we hired uh, Chief Spies, uh, which I'm very, very glad that we did, uh, we uh, put in him, we offered him an employment contract, which uh, I felt worked to his benefit uh, as, uh, uh, as our new chief executive of our police force. I felt that in, uh, by way of keeping things uh, even among, between the fire department and the police department, that we should also offer to our fire chief a similar employment contract so that he would be on equal footing with the police chief when it came to the relationship with the city. Uh, as I said, I viewed this as a benefit to him. Um, he did not immediately uh, Take that, uh, take that offer, but, uh, but over time, I think he's had a chance to review that, and he, I think he sees it as a benefit to him. And so this bill is actually just a, uh, uh, a codification of that contract, and like I said, I've already presented this to the Board of Aldermen, so uh, I don't have any uh, information about the particulars of the contract, but I believe you had it in your, your board mm -hmm. pack. So. Any questions about that? Alderman Sims. Unless I missed something or I don't have an updated copy, the agreement under section five of salary, there, there isn't a, you know, there's a placeholder, but there isn't an actual figure. We've decided not to pay him. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. As I said, there, there was a little bit of give and take. It, it was, you know, part of it was for his benefit, part of it was for ours. The, the, the no salary was for our, yeah. Got it. Okay. We'll be that filling that safe. in. Okay, yeah, I said if that's coming later yes. or, so, yeah. no. any other questions? Your Honor, it is your intent then that this contract kind of mirrors the police chief's contract? Yeah. To, there's really nothing different between the two? No, it was, yeah, it was very much a, an effort to, you know, to express in a very real and tangible sense to Terry that, that the police chief is not more important to the city than the fire chief. Right. right. They're equally important components of our public safety structure. Yep. And because we had offered one to Joe, uh, and I think it's quite appropriate to offer a chief no, of a department a contract, the uh, same way we do with our city Mayor administrator. Mayor Thornton, there, there is one difference, remember? Yes. Well, there are several differences, okay. don't get me wrong, but they're substantially the same. There are some things that are unique to police that don't apply to fire and vice versa. But I, I don't want to go into the details unless somebody has any questions about it. It's remarkable how similar the differences. All right, very good. Uh, we'll move along then. Um, New business. Now we're on uh, resolution 1105. 1105 yes. Right. So, Alderman Wege, uh you asked this to be brought off the agenda, so I will uh, uh, defer to you on the discussion. Sure. Well, actually, let's. Can we first get a motion to adopt the resolution, and then we'll have the discussion? Unless you want to postpone it. No, I'd like to have a discussion about it. Okay, very good. So, could I have a motion to adopt resolution 1105? So, so moved. Move. <laughs> uh, we'll call in uh, Alderman Leahy's the second. So first, I didn't even mention it. was us. Oh, uh, Alderman Sims. <laughs> we did the, All right, very good. Uh, discussion. <laughs> Alderman Leahy, please. Yeah. So we, we talked about this at Public Works. Um, so we hadn't had a chance to see any of the drawings of, of the building that was here. Um, basically, it, it's this. So we're we're looking at four hundred seventy thousand dollars for a garage for a tractor, uh, which is in a flood zone and may be knocked down by the sewer department at any point in the future. Um, I have a hard time standing in front of my constituents and defending really any of this. And uh, I know we budgeted for it, uh, but I, I believe we have to find a better way uh, for than, than this garage. So uh, I am not in favor of, of passing this resolution, uh, including taking away some of the, um, you know, the cobbling of the, the outside and the architecture landscape, uh, which would bring the price down by $70,000. I just can't reconcile the cost of this at all. Alderman Dimmitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Following up on Alderman uh, Weggie's point, I, I'm at a complete loss. You know, I, I agree we did budget this. Um, I don't know if we created some expectation by doing that, that the um, way I looked at it, that we didn't expect to be any more than that. Then when, when we end up seeing what we're going to get for that, I have a hard time understanding how we can spend that amount of money. I don't know what it's being spent on. I guess, and that's what we talked about at, at Public Works. 
is if we could get some answer, how much of this was electrical, how much of it was plumbing, so on and so on. My, my recollection is that we're talking about a 2,300 square foot building, to about 10% of which is an office that would be air conditioned and heated. Um, the rest of it then is just a garage. And, and I don't, you know, <laughs> it's, it would be the nicest garage, um, be a monument to, to garages. So I, <laughs> I, I agree with Alderman Weggy. I have a hard time. The, po the apotheosis of all right. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, it sits on the hill with the columns. Alderman Lockman. Yeah, your committee handled this, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'd be really <laughs> thrilled to hear from you at this yeah, point. Yeah, I hear unanimously. This huh. is positive how recommendation. Did, how did that happen? Uh, that was um, an interpretation. I'm going to ask the chairman. <laughs> Well, I'm going to ask our city administrator if we've got somebody from B BI maybe that ex could break down the cost. If actually, I don't see um, I'd, I'd sure. like for Molly uh, and Dan, they're going to tag team this. Okay. We also have the architect, Andy Frankie, who's also part of our Brentwood Bound team. And the gentleman sitting next to Andy is from BBI. So I oh, think. Hold on. All right. So, so, so before I, we hold on, uh -huh. before we start, <laughs> I, I want to get a sense of the board on this. It's eight thirty, sure. right? Do we do we want to work all this out now in a public meeting, or would there be some inclination to refer this back to committee? This came so, from Public Works with unanimous recommendation. I understand I, that, but apparently there's. I, I, I'm I, just want a sense of the board. I'm just I'm just trying to get a straw poll here, Mr. Chairman. Proceed or no? If if I may. Part of the questions that are being asked are in the memo mm -hmm. attached to this action. Yeah. Get all, go down below all the billing. They did break out finally the costing for us, which we hadn't seen earlier. That might help set, shed some light on this. Mm -hmm. It didn't change the gross total value, but it tells you where the money's going. Okay. Well, I, like I said, I'm fine with either way. I just want to make yeah. sure that this is the time and place that we want to do it. That's, I'm good if you want to go. I, one clarification. So the, the motion that I made at Public Works, because we didn't have a drawing to look at or any details, was to bring it to the full board. There was no recommendation from me for approval on that. So right. I, I do not stand behind that conclusion. Right. Again, we did not have enough information. There was an urgency on this, so we wanted to bring it to the full board. board. Yes. I, if, if that was interpreted that way, because I, I was not awesome. supportive of this at that time, and said we would need to have more detail before we can make a decision on this. Yes. Okay, fair enough. We're prepared to explain and answer all your questions tonight. So, again, my question to the board, I guess I'll just ask for objections to proceeding with that, or? Well, seeing none, go ahead. Who do you want first? Molly. Molly Kukuru. Did I pronounce that? <laughs> you got it right. Okay. Yes. Molly Kukuru, Operations Superintendent. Um, so thank you guys so much. So. I'm speaking on behalf of Eric here, but really this is to replace the uh, maintenance building that was demolished um, due to digging up the pipe with MSD. They did allow for us um, to actually rebuild the building uh, where the pipe is at. Um, and then they also um, had given us $90,000 um, for the demolition of the old building. So that, that's kind of where we stand as far as that goes. So there were seven bids turned in. BBI was the lowest with the 425. Um, I guess what questions can I answer? So Molly, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yeah. So is it, are you saying that MSD is actually paying for this and we're not? So MSD did give $90,000 for the demolition of the old building. But nothing for the, for the new. So um, I would recharacterize re that okay, and say, sorry for that building and the inc the inconvenience of it having to be torn down the city Correct. received a total of 90,000. Okay. So part of the challenge is that the building the original building should have never been built where it was. Dan please join uh, Molly <laughs> at the uh, podium. And then when we started doing soil testing, um, we discovered that um, over the years the city, as we would do projects, instead of taking construction items to a landfill and disposing of it properly, um, this goes to a lot of the things that the mayor said earlier, we took it to some of our existing site and buried it. So the cost to build this building on a city property, I believe um, 30,000, 
30 plus 59, that's almost 90,000 of this cost, is grading, site earthwork, burrow and compaction, grading, finish, grading, erosion, control, silt fence. So we continue to find things that were not done properly in the past, and we continue to have to incur funds to rectify it. So 90,000 of the cost of this building is for that. Dan, I'll let you continue. Yeah, uh, that's correct. There was, uh, whenever they did the geotechnical investigation, they found that it was just, you know, could be parts of a street, old asphalt, old concrete, whatever was broken up. Instead of being hauled away like we do now, we'll take it to Weber or wherever we take it. You know, our street spoils too. I guess that was a low lying area. They filled it in, they built baseball fields on it. They added this shed. Whenever they extract the soil, it's real friable, real brittle. It's not decent clay. It's just a bunch of junk for lack of a better term. So in order to build the foundation for this building, your choices are to drill down, put in piers, or over excavate, which is cheaper, and that's what they decided to do. Over excavate, cut out the bad soil, you know, seven, eight feet, fill it back up with compacted rock, then start with your foundation. So it's more than just putting up a garage or a shed on virgin soil, it's actually remedying the problem, which is the soil conditions, or you'd have to pick a different site. You know, if you moved it somewhere else, it may not necessarily be zoned for this garage. It may be residential and it may not fit with the architecture. You know, there's lots of other troubling things that could occur. We oh, also we looked at um, a property that was for sale on Londell um, because it would be on higher ground, but we thought about, we want to preserve homes. We want families to continue to move into Brentwood. Therefore, that was not an ideal location to place this building. So we ruled that out and thought, we need to find higher ground. We need to build that soil up. We need to remove the things that we had put there over the years that should not have been there. So the true cost of the building is 139,206. Well, then you add electrical, you had uh, mechanical and plumbing, you add site demolition preparation, you add grading, and that's how we get to the number of that low bid, 455032. Andy, could, is there anything that you could add to this? Andy Frankie, um, landscape, city's on call, landscape architect. Good morning, or good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, it's been a long <laughs> Not yet, but it could be. Is it Friday already? Um, yeah. One of the things I think the mayor talked about is going back and correcting problems. Um, probably the worst thing when we started this project that we would ever want to have to come back to you guys to say is, we built a brand new building in a floodplain, and guess what, it got flooded again. So in addition to, have to, to having to rectify bad soil, we also have to build this building up out of the floodplain, so it has to be a foot above the base flood elevation. So it, it sounds easy to say and simple to say, well, it's just a garage with an office in it, what complicates it in this particular case is we're on a site that's very difficult to deal with. Almost all of, of Brentwood Park is in a floodway, so we have to deal with the flooding issue. We also have to deal with MSD's requirements as well. We have to ex literally extend a storm sewer pipe, a 54-inch storm sewer pipe, from our friends at Millman Lumber to our site and then connect it up with a pipe to get it onto our, our site. So this site is complicated, has a lot of problems, and that's why what seems like a simple building becomes very expensive when we have to deal with the site that we're working on. Alderman Dibbett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bola, what you were reading from, do we have that? Um, I do not believe so. It, I'd love to have, get my hands on that so okay. we could see, what you is, know. There are some numbers in the memo that is in board docs. Okay. That are different than what Bola said, but. Yeah. yeah. Plus or minus 30 percent. And, and, and the, the numbers that BOLA has are the engineer's estimate. They're not BBI's numbers exactly. broken out from their bid. They're, they had a lump sum bid on this project. Did, did we get BBI's proposal into board docs? Yeah, it's in here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. Yeah, and neither did I. Their That's why I asked. Agreement. Well, the contract is in there, but we didn't see the proposal. Yeah, I didn't see the proposal. It was the final number, alternate one, alternate two. We, d we didn't break no, it down we, like you were asking. Brandon had asked for the proposal earlier, and I, yeah. Anyway, Alderman uh, Leahy. Mr. Frank, the question I have for you, you're raising this potential new building a foot above the flood plain. Mm -hmm. Am I correct that the mouth 
of the driveway coming off of Russell and uh, uh, Bremerton is the height of the flood line because the dike's just a little bit higher than that. But that's where my lowest point in that whole dike area is because we have seen that whole dike get breached. So how high up are you putting this building from what would be the level of Diamond 4? The children's diamond, the soccer field, the thing all net closest, farthest west end of the of the property. That's at 456, so we'd be above. It. It's four, 462 is the elevation of the the finished floor of the building. 462. 462, and that and that diamond is roughly 450. 456. So I've got a six foot base going into the ground floor of the building. Yeah, you have to go up six feet, yes. Now, we're going to that site because the prior site has the new pipeline through it, and MSD is going to tell you, you're not building on it. So we had to go find a new site, and this is the best one we can fit this building into. Th that's, that is correct, and um, as Bull had alluded to, you couldn't build that building at that elevation today. It would be, you wouldn't be allowed because it's below the flood elevations. You got to raise it. It's big. So my driveway has to have a six foot slope. It's got, yeah, yeah. It's got to get into this thing. Yeah, it's going to be. It's going. There's going to be. It's not going to be that. It, that's that's it's steep. It's not going to be that tight. We're going to stretch it. Because you're coming the around head. the. You're coming around the backside. Um, but now, during I don't want anybody to under to think that during flooding you'll be able to drive right into the no, facility. You, you won't. But the things that are in the facility will remain dry, assuming we don't go above the base flood elevation. So everything won't have to be evacuated every time there's a flood like, there, like it is now. It's, it's not a good situation. We also, uh, when we did the master plan for this, we looked at locating it on a property that was on the other side of the street. That was flood buyout land, and you can't yep. build a building on flood buyout. So, Correct. So we're really hemmed in here on what we can and can't do. There's no obvious smoking gun solution. Uh, if we want to put a maintenance building in Brentwood Park, and it's critical to have that there so we can maintain those fields efficiently. Alderman Kramer. Uh, Your Honor, I wasn't able to attend that the, the meeting where this subject came up, but I am curious, based upon the cost, the cost this, uh, for this proposal, is there and I understand what, what you just said about the, the critical nature of that being on site. However, based upon the cost and the fact that we already own uh, a, a sizable building pretty nearby on Manchester Road, is there anything about this that can't be absorbed into our existing public works facility? There are equipment that stay on site um, and proximity. That can't be transported? Um, proximity would be ideal. Um, I, I think that we're, are we not at capacity at, at the public works site? Yeah, I know, I know what was in that building before. I mean, they use it for dragging the fields. You know, there's a small tractor, there's a side-by-side, -side. they empty the trash cans, there's Now, if the turfus. city wants to purchase a truck so that we can load all of the equipment up on it and then drive it to the park, I'm sure Eric would be happy about that. The, here, here's the reason why I ask is, I. I Assuming that the Manchester Road renewal project uh, is successful and completed, at our public works site, we had the Luttrell building that we purchased and tore down immediately adjacent to that building. Is there no reason why we couldn't save some money and, and construct this type of a building adjacent to our public works garage and build in a transportation cost instead of trying to put a building up on, on some sort of support system to keep so, it out yeah, of the floodplain. I'm, I'm looking at future economic development that might be better use, highest use. But didn't we buy that Luttrell property for our use in the future, though? It was not determined what the use would be. Okay. Alderman Wiggy, I have a couple questions for the architect started and, this. and then some for Molly. <laughs> right. And I'm going to finish it. No matter how many questions I take. Go ahead. All right, so if MSD needs to uh, access that pipe, they're going to knock down our building again, right, after we build it? No. 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 Not at this location. No, not at this location. So in the memo it says that 
it would still flood and it would still need to be knocked down in this location because we couldn't go the field four. Is that not true? That's not true. <coughs> I'm not sure what you're reading there. The old building was built over the sewer. The new building is not over the sewer. I can't imagine they'd let you build it. No. <laughs> if, if I may. So Eric says the confusion about the cost is not how much money the building is, it is how much it is going to cost to move it to field four and remediate the soil, get it out of the floodplain. So I believe the proposal is to move this to field four, remediate the soil, get it out of the floodplain, which ensures that the equipment and materials stored there will never be damaged, thus saving um, the city money in the long run. The old building should have never been built in the location it is currently in. Right. So MSD indicated that it ever needed access to the pipe again, it might need to demolish the building again. That's, that's not true because location. it's not over the building. No, no. At the old location. At the old location. At the old, if we built it, the, on the old if, site. if we built the new building today where the old one was and they needed to access that pipe, they would tear the building down again to access the pipe. But we chose not to put it in that location. So we're, but we're basically moving it. Yeah. You know, if, if it's at nine o'clock on the clock right now, we're moving it to like seven o'clock. Kind of where the old, where the backstop is on that field, back in that corner. Okay, so you're saying it's not over the, even though the drawing has the. I can show you the drawing. I have it here if you'd like to I see it. I have it here it. too. Okay. All right, so there would be no danger if MSD needed to access that pipe that they would have to knock down this building. None. They might rip up the driveway to get to it, but not the building. Okay. So Molly, question you, what, what have we been doing with the tractor? in the last year when we haven't had a building there. Sure, so right now it's sitting outside. It's parked near um, the, the old concession area, and it's not ideal. I will say it was one of my first concerns that I saw on a park tour when I saw kids climbing and playing on it, and I questioned Eric, should this have been put up? Because I, I did feel like it was a safety concern right then and there, and that was not the only piece of equipment that is left out right now. So um, there are several smaller, bigger pieces of equipment, but there is nowhere um, to, to put them, and there is no transportation right now to bring them back and forth, is how it was explained to me. So those are just sitting near the concession area for anybody who's around with. So it's a safety concern as far as I would see it. Okay, and then looking at the drawings, is there an air-conditioned part of this building? It doesn't no. appear from the, the drawing that there is, so it is basically a garage with a couple man doors and a, a garage door. Yes. <clears throat> All the cobble on the, the culvert and everything, is that purely decorational? Yeah, and, and um, I feel I owe you guys an explanation on that. If you look on that drawing, it's going to be quite a crater or a rock. Um, we tried to, again, the other idea behind locating it in this location is to try and get away from general people that are using the park. It's still going to be quite an eyesore, so we thought um, maybe if we use some decorative rock, it might not make it look so uh, uh, so bad. That was the thinking behind it. Alderman Leahy. Thank you. A couple of questions. Molly, I'm going to start with you, but unfortunately you're, the, you're going to get blindsided. As you pointed out, the concession stand building is there. Molly, move closer to the mic. Yeah. Yes. In the 38 years that I've lived down in this area of town, that concession stand has not been used. Only the two little bathrooms have been. My question to the Parks Department is, has anyone looked at remodeling that area to put a, just a simple storage shed so that we can handle the equipment and put it there? Because there's no pipe or anything underneath it except the, the solid waste pipes that go in for the bathrooms. And we get to clean up the bathrooms also. Now. Has that been proposed to be looked at? And is there something that says I can't do that? I can't answer that. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm a little. Yep, a little go ahead. It, it floods, that simple. It, it floods, but so did my other building. And just for the storage of, I've got two main tractors and two little ATV vehicles is what that parks down there. 
From there, I've got the hand tools and the lime and everything else that I use to mark fields and the storage equipment for the game flags right. to work with. I can move it as I need to, but I'm not spending a half million dollars to build Fort Wreck to sit there that, yes, will flood, won't be access, and if they ever need to dig up the pipe, down goes your wall, and when that happens, there's going to be a, how do we hold the soil back while they go 25 feet down? I'm huh. looking for something a little bit more plausible in what is there to use with. You've got the concession building, you've got the little pavilion building coming west, and you've got a large open green space before you get to the high school baseball diamond that we could fit a building in. The building floods, the building's too small, um, and the building would require, when it floods, you'd have to move equipment in and out. We have floods multiple times, so you'd be, doing, you'd be taking manpower that normally you could use to, to maintain parks. Now they're just ferrying stuff in and out in emergency situations. Um, when you look at the way that that facility is laid out, um, putting a maintenance facility right in the middle of where all the people are doesn't make any sense functionally. Um, because that, that area you probably wouldn't want to have maintenance vehicles driving in and out. The building itself isn't big enough to put all that equipment or store all that stuff. In. The current building, no. But if I reconfigure that space, can you give me a facility that will work? I and can I, do my that. My bathrooms would be dual purpose because I got my staff and my public using them. We'd have to remove the entire building and raise it to the same level that this one is because it has to be one foot above the base flood elevation. It has to be. I'm, it, I'm stuck a, to it. Okay. You're stuck to that. Any, any buildings that come, any new buildings in there are going to have to be built at that right. flood level. Now, since you've made that statement, in the memo that we were given <laughs> that is dated October 1st, under the background section in paragraph 4, it establishes that when the Parks and Recreation Department was preparing to rebuild the park maintenance building, alternate locations for the park maintenance building were considered. MSD did agree to allow the city to place the city, to place the city, and I think it should be building, the building on the exact same location, which flooded and thing. Once MSD had completed the project, but the building would still be over the pipe, and MSD indicated that if it ever had it needed access to that pipe again, that it would need to demolish the building. Now, if I can put that building right back where it was, how can I do that? And you're going to raise me up the height of, the, of field four plus six feet more to put that new building back to that lo old location? MSD said they would allow it. The Corps of Engineers will not allow you to do it. Okay. And the other issue is the city's floodplain manager, which is kind of the city's itself, saying mm -hmm. we wouldn't allow you to do, do it. it. So yeah. then our next best alternative was to look for something just outside the park area. I've got the two lots that are down there along Russell, but they have deed restrictions from SEMA. Right. I have the house, and as you mentioned, you don't want to take homes, but that one house right outside the park on Russell, right at the corner of Russell and Bremerton. That was available, but I don't know if that's big enough to put a building. The in house the, that's on stilts? No, that one that had the hot car run through the front door. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, to work with, but other than that, there's no other location down there. Alderman Kramer's offer of, can I go back and use Manchester Road and just keep rotating Trailer. things back and forth? The vehicles we have, and yeah, the trick is, is I'm gonna cost time and effort running across the fields to get where I need to, but I'm not spending a half million dollars right. to put a building six feet up in the air. The, the city's looking for ways to cut cost. I mean, there's about, and this is engineer's estimate, so I, I really don't have exact numbers without going back to the memo. Um, what the cost to landscape the area is, we can do that over time. Um, I'm trying to find the memo, whether it is uh, broken out. Um, Landscaping was priced here. at forty-four thousand twenty dollars, twenty-eight dollars. Wait a minute. No. I'm sorry, twenty-one thousand one hundred nine. There you go. Yeah. What is the landscaping cost? Twenty-one thousand one hundred nine. Some was, of that cost might. Well, actually, the sod is a different number, so you're you're right. 
So the saw is 8,200. The landscaping plantings are 14,300. It's got some saw in it. And so what's the total number? So if the, if the city's looking to save money, we can eliminate um, landscape. I don't know where the <laughs> I don't know where the 44 is going. I just don't know where that number is coming from. Then just do from. that over time. We do have to sod it though. You want to you want to see what we're looking at, for, Mr. Frank? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You want to see what we're looking at? As I, I've got it now. Okay. I was confused. Thankfully, Molly steered me in the right direction. <laughs> the, I think the other issue related to ferrying things around is sometimes in the site we don't know when it's going to happen mm -hmm. because Deer Creek's very flashy. Yep. And I'm sure you guys have heard that a million times. If not, you will in the next year. And sometimes we just can't get the equipment out fast enough. Correct. And you'll lose it. We've had ins That's instances where it, that has happened exactly where some of our tractors have actually flooded. Yes. So. We couldn't get them up to the lots yep. just to let them sit right. there overnight right. because right. it, it came too quick. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yep. May I please inter interject uh, a similar thought again? Um, first, I'm hoping that this will just go back to the Public Works uh, committee and get resolved. I don't know what the if there's an emergency, it has to be done. Um, one of the contractors um, that will be working with BVI on this in terms of timing um, is also um, working on the MSD project. So, in terms of efficiency, because they're already starting their project, um, and every item that they need they need for this is already on location. So we won't have to incur the cost of setup, breakdown, setup, breakdown. So from an efficiency standpoint, we're trying to capitalize on that. May I ask Director Dan, is there anything on our existing Public Works garage site, the lot itself, that would lend itself to storage of this equipment? Uh, not without building another outbuilding. You know, if you build something like where the Latrell used to be of this same magnitude, because there's not enough room interior, and in interior wise, we have to make room for our plows, which is what we do. So whenever we outfit, say, like truck 52 or 55 with the plow, all the plow equipment goes in the garage. So if there's a tractor in there, I've got to get it out of there, because I can't be loading up salt and scraping windshields clean whenever I need to be salting roads. And we know that during the winter season, if the temperature drops like it did this past year, we had to park all the our trash trucks. trucks are going in there. Right. But without the Latrell space, just on the lot that you have itself right now, the fenced area that you have access to. You'd have to move the fence out. There's not enough uh, footprint within the fenced in area to put everything that they have within that footprint. And have we had anything flooded, any equipment flooded there that we have right now? At Public Works? Right. To my knowledge, no. Whenever okay. I've talked to people, the worst I saw was in 2016 when I came aboard and it flooded fast and all but it left us alone but it flooded part of our parking lot but we didn't lose any equipment earlier it came i think the flood of 2008 to the heard stories that it came um it, it put water in the it, yeah. inside the first floor of the building right about yeah. three inches deep yeah, yeah. thank you well, the Malay? i'd like to make a motion and request that this uh contract ordinance resolution be sent back to public works and at that time, detailed drawings be provided to the committee to look at and hopefully maybe come up with an alternate suggestion. That's the motion. Should we reject the bid also? No, I'm not no. rejecting the bid because okay. I agree with Alderman Wiggy. We didn't get enough good documents to be able to go forward. We wanted to get it to the board to have the discussion. But the limit is, is I, I think it's a half million dollars that you're spending for a maintenance building. And I'm just not picturing it as a reasonable expectation of what you're putting down there. But it may be by limitations the best alternative that's out there. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that this uh, resolution 1105 be referred to committee. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? So what was the <clears throat> what is the impact of that? I mean, again, there was an urgency we, to get we, it here. We've lost that opportunity. Yeah, we would okay. reject it. I mean, the the so effect so of that would be that we would so reject it. So the cost may ultimately go up. Yeah, it won't. It won't. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I could, most of these things have a thirty day shelf life or whatever. So. 
I don't want any. Can I just check my thinking on this? It looks to me as though the $174,000 for the building is the building cost. Everything else is prepped up the site to get it above the floodplain. So it doesn't matter what the design of the building is, the majority of the money is going because of the site. to get it high enough mm -hmm. to work. Exactly. That's exactly correct. So I'm not sure that the committee is going to do anything except look at the elevations and say this is more attractive or this is less attractive. I'd be inclined to say we're faced with the problem. Let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> We could discuss alternate sites for this and figuring out how this could, the equipment could be transported whenever needed. Uh, I don't think it's a very effective way to look at things, but if that's what the board wants, we'll take it back there and take a look at it. Okay, the pending motion is to refer uh, resolution 1105 to the public safe, uh, sorry, public works committee. Uh, let's see, I'm going to ask for a show of hands just so I can keep it clear. All in favor of the motion to refer this back to the Public Works Committee, raise your hand please. And that looks like seven. <laughs> and all opposed, one. Uh, the motion will carry. The resolution 1105 will be referred back to the Public Works Committee and we'll look for a report at the first board meeting after the next Public Works Committee meeting. We'll have it. Very should good. Be, should have it for the 15th. Uh, that might be a little quick. Tight. Yeah, I'm thinking we're going to look for a meeting at the first, first of November. Fifth, fifth uh, of. The, the, key, the critical thing at this point, given that we're rejecting the bids, is I'm sure it will have to go back out, and I'm sure that we need to have it in our 2019 budget. So it, we, you know, November should be, I think, the, you know, we should definitely shoot for November to get it in for those purposes. Right, because it won't be completed Correct. in uh, 2018. Correct. And, and that was due to the, to the fact the project clear took a, went they're, beyond its they're deadline. They're not at the schedule. They're behind yeah. schedule. Right. All right. Uh, they're trying. To Other than what? You could, yeah. Just one more question for Molly. Sorry. Where is so the equipment is sitting outside right now, so I can drive down there and take a look at it. Yeah. Is it by where the building used to be, or is it behind the fence, or? No, it, it's right near the concession. Yeah. So kind of almost behind it. Okay. And is the plan to keep it there all winter? In the, <laughs> 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 the plan now is a tarp. <laughs> the plan now is a tarp. Uh, okay. Any further discussion? I'll, uh, Andy, I, yeah. I, I parting do. shots. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, and, and I feel compelled to say this, and I'll, I'll bet a dollar when these bids come back, it'll be higher. I, I just, it's there, and and I'm I'm not trying to sound. Uh, arrogant or anything, but I don't think you're going to find a better site. You got a bid. Uh, it's time to go. The MSD contractors in there. Now is the time to build. It sounds absorbent and uh, outrageous that you're almost spending a half a million dollars, but that's the physical constraints of this site. And there's not a smoking gun or a magic hat you're going to find out there. There are elements of this project that the contractor that's working for MSD has agreed to throw into for the city. So there is a little yeah, bit of cost. Yeah, I, I think everybody understands that. I, 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 think, I think the board's clear on that, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I think everybody that. understands. Uh, I think I just want they've to expressed that they're not comfortable with that risk at this point in time, and they want the committee to look at it. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Citizen comment. Sorry, I got off track. Mm -hmm. Citizen comment. comment. Uh, yeah, so item number 12, citizens' comments. So uh, we seem to have lost a lot of our citizens. Um, if any member of the public would care to come forward and address the board on the subject of your choosing, uh, feel free to do so. You'll be given three minutes at least, maybe more. All right, seeing none, uh, we have a closed meeting on tonight's agenda. If I could get a motion. Your Honor, I would make the motion that we adjourn to executive session for purposes of legal under uh, revised Missouri statutes, chapter 610.021. Second, Your Honor. It's been moved and seconded that the board go into closed session pursuant to RSMO 610.211, legal, uh, and adjourn therefrom. <laughs> so moved. <laughs>
Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Madam City Clerk, could I have a roll call on the motion, please? My bad, I'm sorry, I was No, no, that's all right. I, I, I saw who was really at fault. Oh. Yeah. Alderman Dimmitt? Yes. Alderman Kramer? Yes. Alderman Leahy? Yes. Alderman Lockmiller? Yes. Alderwoman O'Neill? Yes. Alderman Plufka? Yes. Alderwoman Sims? Yes. Alderman Wiggy? Yep. All right, folks. Um, it's probably just going to work to go across the hall, and this won't take long. So. Say that now. 